And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Door Bible Church. I'd like to invite the people in the vestibule to come in and take your seats in the auditorium as we begin to prepare for our worship service. And a special welcome to those of you joining us online. Uh, thank you for joining us. You might want to leave a little note there that uh, you are uh, watching. That's helpful to us. Looking at what's coming up this week, no Awanas this week, but fasten your seatbelts because next weekend the activities really uh, go into full swing. Friday, the young adults activity. Saturday evening, gospel music uh, concert here at the church. And there are uh, further details on those things available in your bulletin. Next Sunday at 9 a.m. during the Sunday school hour, uh, Randy and Brenda Harmon of Village Missions will be presenting their work at 9 a.m. So we would encourage you to come and hear about the great things that are happening in at the Village Missions uh, mission. <laughs> and let me see. You'll notice that the name of the church is the Open Door Bible, thank you very much. <laughs> Open Door Bible Church. We are big on Bible study. COVID kind of hit, hit us as far as not, you know, the Bible studies had to disband and all that. But we want to, and some have rejoined, and we want to make sure that your needs are being met. And so that's why there is a survey that we would encourage you to fill out and uh, leave at the information booth or just hand it to any one of the uh, deacons or elders. And uh, this is regarding um, a survey regarding your interest in small group Bible studies. Would highly encourage you to get involved in that. Uh, I know I'm involved in one and it is a fantastic time of fellowship but also getting into God's word. Now let's begin to prepare for worship.
great hymn. Great done. Thank you, Catherine. The call to worship from Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I'll be glad and exult in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Lord God, Jehovah, King of the universe, this morning we lift our eyes to see your glory. We open our hearts to receive your love. And we engage our minds to understand your truths. We offer our songs to praise your name. And we do all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to begin to worship together this morning. Thanks again, Kathy, for a great hymn to focus our, our thoughts. And uh, let's, let's express together now our, uh, our awe of God's uh, greatness and also care for us this morning. Our Father, Creator, you hold our hearts together. There's no one higher than you. Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty Savior. There's no one higher than you. You are always with us us to forgive us by your power we've been set free and lord we stand amazed in your presence astounded by your mercy and love our hands are lifted high in
This is a great hymn text, and there's a couple of different melodies that, uh, that are still kind of commonly sung with it. This particular melody um, kind of expresses the intensity of God's love for us. So let's give it a try together. Oh, me. 
I have a shelter in the storm when troubles pour upon me. Though fears are rising like a flood, my soul can rest securely. Lord Jesus, I will hide in you, my place of peace and shelter in the storm when all my sins accuse me though justice charges me with guilt your grace will not refuse me oh Jesus I will hide in you who bore my condemnation I find my refuge There we go. Thank you. Um, we're going to have Lydia, the other half of the dynamic duo that went to Brazil this summer, come on up and share. Uh, it's the rebuttal of the, what he shared last week. So come on up. Yeah. So Josiah shared last week, but I can tell you what really happened now. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So when people come back from missions trips, um, it's fun to hear like all the exciting stuff that happened, people got saved, like miracles, things like that. Um, but when me and Josiah went to Brazil in January, um, it was just a good reminder that missions isn't actually always as exciting as it seems. Um, when Josiah mentioned last week that COVID changed a lot of our plans, and in one way they changed is that we had more free time than we were expecting. Um, sometimes it's, it was a little bit frustrating but I think it helped reminded us um, that missions and just life in general isn't just about staying busy. Um, it's really important to find time to spend with God. And because things were a little bit slower, we both got some extra devotion time that we probably wouldn't have had. Um, it was really good and refreshing. Um, another thing we learned in Brazil was, um, or we just were encouraged by, was just the, the like, bigness of the church. Um, like the global church. Um, it was really cool to get to know the people in the churches in Brazil. Um, some of them had us over for dinner, or took us out to eat. Um, even though they didn't speak English, it was cool just the connection we have in Christ and just being able to see that um, in another country is really cool. Um, probably one of the things that impacted me the most um, was a testimony from a young man that was in the youth group um, in the second place we were at in Brazil. Uh, I think Josiah mentioned him last week um, he's been, like, struggling with cancer for the past few years. Um, he's not doing very good, and he lost his leg to cancer. Um, but the thing that is, like, the most sad to him right now is that from being in the hospital, he's gotten to know some friends 
there really well, but then they die. And he just encouraged us and the other people in the youth group that life is short, um, not just for people with cancer, though. Like three or four years ago, he had no idea he had anything wrong with him um, as far as his health goes. Um, so that was just a good encouragement for me to live with urgency because I don't know how long my life is and I don't know how long the people around me, um, how long their lives are, especially people that don't know the Lord. Um, yeah, so just going to Brazil was a really good experience for me and Josiah and um, I feel really blessed that we got to do that. Um, yeah, thank you for praying for us. We really appreciated it. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. Let's back up just one slide. Just uh, I, I made a mistake in moving too quickly. This is just a reminder. This is something we need to be constantly going in, through in our own minds and hearts and praying. Pray also for, um, and you can go ahead and go to the next one then. Uh, Frank and Kathy King um, have a big meeting this coming week, and it's the business meeting for all of their uh, all the different churches that they're working with. And in the past, those have been somewhat contentious, and so they've asked us to pray for them during that. The next slide is uh, James and Rachel. And James and Rachel are actually heading for Japan after all, sometime in July. But uh, right now he's got <clears throat> a ship. Uh, his ship is in, the one that he uh, was out on for, for uh, 10 months. But when they're in port, they live at home and they have an office and that kind of stuff right nearby. And there's another ship that does not have a chaplain, so he's actually servicing two of these ships with all the Marines and all the sailors. And, and uh, he's very busy, so pray for James. He loves what he does, but sometimes it can be pretty long, long hours. Also, they'd like us to pray that they get all the clearances and paperwork done that they're supposed to get so that they can actually go to Japan. They're supposed to, but... A whole bunch of stuff has to happen for that to take place. Um, Bob and Gloria Dunbar, I just heard from them. Bob no longer has COVID. He, uh, he's over that, praise God, yeah. And then um, she is still, she, she got it a week later, so she said, I think in another week or so I'll be, I'll be off the other side. But they've been, they've been okay. I talked with John Herman this week. He is home, and he's going through health care there. And, um, boy, he just, we just talked for 10, 15 minutes and uh, just really enjoyed talking to him. He especially said thank you. Uh, a number of people sent cards and people, uh, you know, sent texts and that kind of thing, and, and he just was very, very thankful for that. Continue to pray for Craig Brown as he tries to get the clearances medically to have his surgery on the 24th that's coming, and that's a surgery on his, on his hip. Uh, keep praying for Cammie, um, Daryl Morrison, Bill Butler, all those folks. Bill Butler actually is home now. He did tolerate both of the infusions. And, and just so that you understand, he has a really rare form of leukemia, and so there's, it's a very, very heavy use of, of uh, chemo that they do. And his first infusion was for six hours, and the next one was for five, and they were Monday and Tuesday or Tuesday and Wednesday. And then he goes weekly after that. So they've asked us to pray for him and his be ability to tolerate that and that the medication would actually do what it's supposed to do and, you know, that he'd be free of leukemia again. <clears throat> anyway, continue to pray for Latvia, too. Uh, we heard uh, from... Nathan and Vera, the Czech Republic, and they're, t they're talking about all of the surrounding European nations, surrounding, um, uh, I can't think of the country now. Um, anyway, yeah, and, and that all of the surrounding nations have an influx of people coming in. Uh, they're refugees just heading everywhere. Uh, and so just pray for them. And it, he mentioned one pastor was, uh, he had a small church, and every night they have 150 people sleeping in the sanctuary. And then that 150 people travel on to the next point that they're trying to get to, and there'll be another 150 that come that day. So every single day of the week, they're putting people up and feeding them. And many of the resources for these um, churches have just gone dry. They don't have any, anything left. And so there, there are ways that you can give, and we'll get that out to you if you would like to give to the relief efforts the churches are doing. We have a way to get that information to you. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to bring all of these things to you. We think of Ukraine, and we are so 
heartbroken. <clears throat> and we have brothers and sisters there, and brothers and sisters who have had to, to flee. And Lord, we have brothers and sisters in countries surrounding there that are desperately trying to meet needs. We ask that you would continue to give what is necessary so people will have a place to eat and sleep. And, and Lord, we pray for this to end. And we would love to see Russia just totally withdraw. So we, we ask that, and we ask that you would work in that. Lord, for our missionaries that are involved in that kind of an effort, as well as the other things, um, we just ask that you'd continue to work in their lives and in their hearts. We think of Rachel and James who are on the move again by July and all the things that have to happen. Would you please overrule in all of that and help them to get everything done so they can pack and be on their way to Japan. We thank you for them and the testimony that they have. We think, too, of the folks in our own family here, Lord, that are struggling and hurting, many of them physically. We've just mentioned them. In, we just want to pray for them, Lord, lay them before you and ask that you would work. For those that are here today and, and are struggling with something they haven't shared with anybody, I ask that you would be an encouragement and a strength to them. I pray that the words of a song or some of the teaching or just someone shaking their hand and talking with them would be a, a real encouragement. And so we ask this in your precious name. Amen. The storm becomes the calm. The sun is slipping through the clouds, showing me the damage done. To say that I've been beaten up doesn't even scratch the surface. I'm past the point of acting tough. We both know how deep my hurt is. I've heard that you're the God who can restore what this world steals. Well, I'm in a thousand pieces. Would you show me how it feels when a fragile heart finds healing hands? The place is numbed by pain, start to feel again. Where you fell apart becomes where you begin. When a fragile heart finds healing hands. I'm sure there will be lessons learned and purpose from the pain. But right now, turn the page so hold on to me Jesus cause the more I feel you near me these jagged lines from every break are slowly disappearing when a fragile heart finds healing hands the place is numb by pain start to feel again where you fell where you begin when a fragile heart finds healing hands all the tears turn into memories and the chains they fall down at your feet right here is where what was broken now is beautiful what was ashes now healing hands the place is numbed by pain start to feel again where you fell apart becomes where you begin when a fragile heart finds healing hands
Amen. Thank you, uh, Aaron, again so much for sharing that song from your heart this morning. Let's stand before we look into God's Word together uh, and sing one more hymn together. I'll always sing kids up through fifth grade can keep an eye out for that slide to head downstairs to Children's Church if your family would like to take advantage of that opportunity. Let's sing, let's sing two verses of this hymn together. Excuse me, I am so sorry. <coughs> Let's take a second pass at that. <laughs> oh, safe to the rock that is higher. selections from Philemon, reading together. I always thank God for you, Philemon, Philemon, I'm sorry, in my constant prayers for you all, for I have heard how you love and trust both the Lord Jesus himself and those who believe in him. It is your love, my brother, that gives us such comfort and happiness for it cheers the hearts of your fellow Christians. I am appearing to that love of you, a simple personal appeal from Paul, the old man in prison for Jesus Christ's sake. I'm appealing for my child. Yes, I have become a father, though I've become under lock and key, and the church's name is Onesimus. Oh, I know that you have found him pretty useless in the past, but he is going to be useful now to both of us. I am sending him back to you. Will you receive him as my son, part of me? It occurs to me that there has been a purpose in your losing him. You lost him, a slave, for a time. Now you are having him back for good, not merely as a slave, but as a brother Christian. He has already especially loved by me. How much more will he be able to love him both as a man and as a fellow Christian? Okay. We're going to be doing our introduction to the book of Colossians from the book of Philemon. So that's where we are today. Um, let's pray. 
Lord, thank you so much for your goodness to us, and thank you for your word. As we look into it today, we pray for understanding and insight, and we ask that you um, would help us to apply the truth that's here. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Very quickly, um, there's a bunch of these Colossians Bible studies right up here on the table and in the back on the, on the, uh, the table back there. Uh, it's something that Carol and I did together um, a number of years ago, and it goes through the book of Colossians. So if you're interested in doing a Bible study yourself while we're going through that, there's uh, 21 lessons in here, and you can, you know, if you take those one a week, we may still be in Colossians by the time you get there. Uh, <laughs> also, if you've ever wondered what it really means to meditate on, God, on God's Word, uh, I remember growing up thinking, oh, it's just, uh, you know, you just think about it a little bit more. Or you think about a verse. And, and one of the things that I did when I was at, at Moody Bible Institute was I put together a kind of a pattern or a template, if you will, for learning how to meditate on God's Word. And that whole process is in here. So if you wanted to do it in two parts, you'd take time to meditate on the verses that are there, and then you would take time later to answer the questions. So help yourself to those. Um, Brian and Sherilyn Davis printed those all up for us, so we're thankful for that. All right. I had a friend of mine in Detroit who, um, he was a police officer, but on the side he did a lot of building and construction. And uh, he would go into old homes that he knew had been scheduled for uh, demolition, and he'd get permission to go in and take stuff, you know, like all the windows and all the trim and all that kind of stuff out of these old houses uh, was worth a lot, and then he would actually clean them up and use them. And one time he said, hey, I know you want to do something in your basement, and um, there's a school that's going to be torn down, and the whole hallway of this school, every floor, upper, upstairs, downstairs, everywhere, has got oak uh, tongue, tongue and groove waste coating with a chair rail. He says, you just pull it out and put it in your own house. And so I went with him down there, and we were working away, <clears throat> and uh, I was getting all this stuff and throwing it in the truck. And at one point I was working, I heard this huge boom. I mean, big, big, big boom. I thought it was a bomb or something. Well, it turned out they had started the demolition that day, and they had started at the other end from where we were working, and they were literally just swinging this ball back and forth and taking two stories of a building down just like that. I mean, just boom, boom. And I actually looked down and saw the, the air and the sky, and I thought, okay, yeah, it's, it's, I've got enough. We don't need any more. <clears throat> and, and the reason I tell that story is that on one level, what Philemon is all about is breaking down walls. There's all kinds of divisions that we have between us. And the Christian church has always had them right from the very beginning, and it still does. Um, one of the divisions that you'll find, let's go ahead and put that first picture up there. This is a one artist rendition of the temple. And the court of the Gentiles would be this area out here. But you see this little wall here? That was called the wall of partition. Let's go to the next slide. It's a little bit clearer. Now here's just, just that wall. You see that there's openings to go through. And um, that was the dividing wall. If you were a Gentile or if you weren't uh, ceremonially pure as a Jew, you were supposed to stop. You were not supposed to go in there at all. And let's go ahead and show the next one. This is actually one of the stones that they recovered that would be by one of those openings. And essentially, it's a warning that says, if you pass this and you're not a Jew that's, uh, you know, fully um, ready to be involved in worship here, you have only yourself to blame for your death. That's kind of the statement that was being made. So this is a very serious thing to the Jewish people, uh, that the temple was, you know, yeah, the Gentiles were welcome, but they were, they were welcome outside of that dividing wall. And that dividing wall was called the wall of partition, the wall of hostility. Ephesians 2.14, some people feel this is what Paul was referring to. Uh, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people in his own body on the cross, and he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And many people feel that that is a statement to that wall we just saw, that when Jesus Christ came and he died, people who accepted him, well, they become believers in Jesus Christ and they're part of the church, and that wall no longer separates Jews and Gentiles. It, it's just not there anymore. Um, the walls of separation still needed to be torn down in every culture in that time frame and in our time frame as well. 
Uh, The walls had to come down, and Paul said this in Colossians 3. We'll spend more time on it in the future. But in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, uncivilized, slave, or free. What is he saying? Hey, none of that stuff matters. It's Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. So when we think about what we're going to look at today, remember that the whole point of what I think Paul is doing is to, div- to break down some of those walls of division, some of those walls that separated one from another. Um, <clears throat> this is a, 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 an amazing letter, and it's written, um, from, it's written to Philemon from a Jewish prisoner. So Philemon is from a Jewish prisoner to a wealthy Gentile about a slave who's been saved. That's the story uh, of Philemon. So let's jump into the, this, uh, book, or this letter together. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. So Paul says, hey, I'm a prisoner. Don't forget that. I'm still here in Rome. Now, remember, this was the first imprisonment where he was in his own home, and he rented that, and then he was you know, guarded by Roman soldiers. But he had all the freedom he needed as long as he stayed in that house, to, to have people come, to write letters, to do all kinds of things. But he was under house arrest for at least, at least two years from what we, uh, what we understand. Um, so he says, I'm, hey, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and, and Philemon, who probably was a very wealthy Colossian, a uh, man from Colossae, hosted a church in his home, owned slaves. Uh, now, there's no record that before this Paul had ever visited Colossae. It's very possible that Philemon and some others, maybe Epaphras, were the ones that were working with Paul in Ephesus, and that from there, different places were formed, different churches, uh, like Hierapolis and Laodicea and Colossae were all right near each other. So to Athea, our sister, probably his wife, to Archippus, some people think it's his son, others think that he was one of the elders or a pastor, he calls him a fellow soldier. And he says, I'm also writing not just to you, Philemon, to these other people and the church that meets in your home. So this is a personal letter to Philemon, but it is also intended to be read to the church family. And that's what he's doing as he's writing this. Now, let's go ahead and put the map up there real quick. Uh, Paul's over there in Rome, and he is sending Tychicus and Onesimus back to all these places. So he Sent to Ephesus and Colossae and Laodicea, all of those places. And there was all kinds of caravan routes that they could have taken, possibly even a ship that they could take to the port of Ephesus. Uh, in, any, in any way that this is set up or any way that we see it, the, the chances are that um, they went to Ephesus first and then they went to Laodicea and finally Colossians or to Colossae where they were able to introduce or give the letter to the church and the letter to Philemon. And, uh, and, and he goes on in verse 4, he says, I always thank my God as I remember you. I hear of your faith, he says. I hear about your faith and the Lord Jesus and the love that you have for everybody else. What an incredible man. I mean, he really loves Philemon. Philemon is a guy that everybody would love to be around, and, and, and his love was very obvious. Uh, and, and, and Paul says, listen, I always remember you in my prayers. It's almost as if he's thinking of Maybe that passage in 1 Samuel <clears throat> where um, Samuel tells Saul, far be it for me, I'm sorry, for, yeah, far be it for me that I should um, dishonor God by ceasing to pray for you. Uh, it's very possible that Paul has that kind of a thought in mind. Where he says, hey, I'm, I pray for you. I pray for you all the time. And I pray for the churches and, and I pray for other believers. So he says, I thank God as I'm remembering my prayer because I hear about your faith, your love for the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. And it seems to be what he's saying here is the more you know the Lord and the more you understand the goodness of the gospel, the more you're going to be active in telling that truth to others, the more you will be sharing it. So it's almost as if he's saying, you know how good this is. This is incredible. The gospel is 
good news. And the more you know that, the more you understand that, the more that's a reality for you, the more you're going to want to share that with other people so they can be part of that amazing, wonderful goodness of God. And I had a friend in Bolivia one time who said, you know, Mark, it's like a gold mine. He said, if I went out and I found a gold mine and I discovered that this was never going to be exhausted, there's more gold than I could ever use, I'd come home and I'd call my family say, hey, you know, you guys need to go out to the gold mine. It's inexhaustible. Take as much as you want. He said, when I finished that, I would be looking around to other people saying, hey, if you have some needs, let me just share with you. There's, there's a gold mine out there. And, and anything you want, you can find, just go out. Go to the gold mine. And, and he said, that's the gospel. The gospel is way better than, than the gold mine. But many times we don't treat it that way. And so I think that's what Paul's saying here. I, I pray that as you understand more fully and completely how good God is and how amazing and wonderful the gospel is, that you will continue and share your faith more and more. He goes on in verse 7 and says, Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. What an incredible statement. He, he was someone who, when they came in contact with him, they went away, they went away feeling like, Wow, that was refreshing, or wow, that was amazing, or that was encouraging. That was Philemon. That's the kind of man he was. And so Paul is saying, I I love to hear about you, and I love to hear how other people describe you, and, and I know that your love results in a refreshing or an encouragement that takes place as you interact with other people. There's an implication here. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother. Uh, your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. How did he do that? How did he refresh people? And I think part of it is tied into his genuine, honest, sincere love that he was willing to share and pour out on anybody. Uh, he, he loved people, and they understood that. Philemon was the kind of guy that people walked away and went, wow, that was, that was really great. I enjoyed being with him. As I was studying it, I had to say, I wonder what people are like when they leave me. Good question, isn't it? What are they like when they leave you? Do they walk away and say, Jish, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> or do they say, oh, that, was, that was encouraging. It was, really, it was really neat to be with them. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 16 that several brothers came to visit him in Greece when he was there, and they encouraged and refreshed his spirit, is the way he puts it in 1 Corinthians I and I moved to Detroit many, many years ago, and we were asked to come by a 98-year-old church that was ready to close its doors. And after we visited and spent some time, they said, yeah, you need to come, and we're willing to do whatever we need to do in order to, to not totally disappear as a church. And so we thought, okay, well, they're, they're ready to go. So we moved to Detroit, settled in, and uh, started to, to make some, some changes and some things that would be helpful. And... And all of a sudden, it was like we had tried to burn the place down. I mean, we were hated by some people like you would not believe. And <clears throat> we, we stayed at it for, for about a year and a half. We kept working at it. But during that time, there were some dark and difficult times. And three or four of the elders were solidly behind me, and they said, Mark, don't give up. Uh, and they encouraged us. But there was one guy in particular, an older gentleman, who come and take me to lunch sit down and talk to me a little bit, and, and <clears throat> more than anything, he'd listen to what, what was going on and the things I was struggling with and the things I was concerned about. And then we would spend some time praying together, and then he would leave. And I would go, huh, that was encouraging. That was refreshing, that time I spent with him. Now, I was thinking through, what, what does it take to be a good encourager? And here's just some suggestions and some thoughts just for my own I uh, experienced things that have encouraged me. The first thing a good encourager is is that he's available. He's not someone who avoids you when he sees you coming. Uh, but he's available to be of help. He's a good listener, someone who listens without interrupting and trying to correct you about all the things that you've just said that were wrong. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm saying stuff, and Carol knows they're wrong, and, and on some level I know they're wrong, but she waits. And later on we come back to it and... Oh, yeah, I know. I was, I was way off on that. But a good listener, someone who does not give pat answers, someone who doesn't say, oh, well, it'll all be okay tomorrow, or, or you know what, God closes the door, he opens a window, you know, and, and all kinds of things like that, that 
Uh, never mind, we'll go there. <laughs> Sometimes trite sayings and little formulas get given to us when they're really not the answer. A good encourager is someone who has walked that road before or something similar, been through those kinds of things, and so they can help walk through it with us. And this is the best one. A good encourager always points us back to the Lord. We have to be pointed back to the source of all comfort, and that is the Lord Jesus. So as we're seeing Philemon, this great encourager of the saints, let's uh, remember that that's something we can say, Lord, help make me, make me an encouragement to people today. Finally, in verse 8, we get to the reason why he actually wrote the letter. <clears throat> Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I, Paul, an old man and also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So he says, Philemon, your love has refreshed all of these people, and, and we are both in Christ, and I have apostolic authority. I have the authority to command you to do what I'm going to ask you to do. But I'm not doing that. Okay, so he said, I have the authority to do this, but I'm not going to do that. Matter of fact, he says, I'm going to appeal to you. And, and this is not the sense of a, of a legal appeal like in a court. This is the sense of a humble request where he is saying, I'm not demanding this. I'm not ordering you to do this. I'm appealing to you and asking for you to do this. And then he tells us what the appeal is in verse 10. I appeal to you, and, and, and again, not a legal request. I appeal to you, this is a humble request, for my son Onesimus. Now, you could got to imagine what that must be for Philemon. He's reading this letter, and he gets to this part, and he sees the name Onesimus, and he knows who Onesimus is. I mean, Onesimus did something, something probably pretty bad, and then ran away. And so he, he, he gets this letter from Paul, and he's kind of all warm and fuzzy, and all of a sudden he says, I want to appeal for Onesimus. Oh, you mean the slave that stole stuff from me and ran away? Yeah, that's the guy. And, and so you, you begin to see here, Paul is laying the groundwork for something. He says, I'm appealing to you for my son. And then in verse 11, he has this really fun play on words that he does here, because the name Onesimus means useful. And he says, formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and to me. And it seems like what he's saying here is that Onesimus will finally live up to his name. He will be what his name is, which is useful. And so he says, um, I, I ask you uh, to, to think through how he's going to be useful to you. And then he says, I'm sending him back to you. That's the legal and the correct and the right thing for him to do. But he says, he is my very heart. I'm sending him, but please remember, he is dear to me. He's my spiritual son. That's the kind of imagery. Matter of fact, the Phillips translation puts verse 12 like this. I'm sending him back to you. Will you receive him as my son, a part of me? I mean, that, that's the intensity with which Paul is writing. He's saying, hey, I, I, I brought this slave to Christ. I, I, I've been working with him, and now I know that he belongs to you, and I'm sending him back. But please understand, things have changed since you last saw Onesimus. And so he shares that with him. Verse 13, he goes on, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. The whole time that Paul's in this kind of home imprisonment, he has to care for his own needs. Um, he has to have people bring food in. He has to have people do all the things. I mean, the Roman government's not giving him anything but two soldiers to sit there with him. Now, the rest of whatever happens, he pays for the house. He pays for all of the things that they need. All that comes from him. And he's got a number of people who come in and out in those two years helping him. And he said, I would love to have Onesimus stay and do for me what you would if you were here. That's what he's saying. But he says in verse 14, I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. So he says, I didn't, I didn't want to presume upon our friendship. I didn't want to assume that this is what you were going to do so I could just do it. I'm not doing that. I'm sending him back to you. Now, it's interesting because they're, the longest person anywhere in the Roman Empire on the, the social strata was a slave. They had absolutely no rights. 
And so Onesimus has no rights at all, and he's a runaway slave, so he has even fewer than none, which is a whole lot less. Um, so here, here's the thing with him. He knows that a Roman slave, or a, a runaway slave, has the opportunity to be instantly executed, if that's what the owners want to do, to send a message to everybody else. He also knows that they could torture him and beat him and do all kinds of things to him. And in some cases, runaway slaves were sold into jobs like mining or others where the life expectancy was very, very low. And so they would do whatever they wanted to, torture the slave, make sure the other slaves knew what would happen to a runaway slave, sell them into some kind of a situation where they're going to, they're going to die very quickly. And so he says, um, you know, I... I don't want anything to be forced. I'm sending them back to you. I want you to be um, thinking that through. Now, in uh, verse 14 from the Phillips translation, it says, If you have a favor to give me, let it be spontaneous and not forced from you by circumstances. <clears throat> so what he's saying is, I would love to have Philemon here, but that's something that you have to decide. I'm not going to force it on you. Verse 15, Perhaps the reason he has separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. Now, again, this is where the writing just becomes, to me, a whole lot of fun. I mean, he's, he's writing about a slave who stole some money or stole some valuable items in order to be able to survive and then left. He, he didn't just be separated for a short time. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, he went on vacation or that he was sent on a, you know, he took a break somewhere. This is a slave running away, doing some damage as he did so. so. But he says, hey, he was separated from you for a little while and um, that, so that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. And now you begin to see how Although Paul did not write against slavery specifically, the minute you start treating your brother in Christ as a brother in Christ, even if he's your slave, that changes that whole dynamic. Philemon could have said, he's my slave, and I'm going to treat him like a slave. But Paul's saying, no, he's your brother in Christ. You need to treat him as a brother in Christ. You need to love him like you love all of the brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. And that's the foundation that, that Paul is laying here so that slavery on one level, and, and there were times where the church, churches had at least half of the people or more were slaves. And so as these kinds of things are being written and as there's this dynamic changing between master and slave to brother to brother, it changed everything, even though he never said, let's just get rid of slavery. That would get rid of slavery if you start treating human beings <clears throat> and others as a brother rather than as a piece of property. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Kim Gross this quote that I thought was helpful. In Christ we are one family, no walls of racial, economic, or political differences should separate us. And Paul would agree with that statement 100%. We're one in Christ. That's it. There shouldn't be dividing lines for any reason between believers. We are believers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I think this quote really actually accurately reflects what Paul was saying. Verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. So he says, hey, you know, are we co-workers? Well, yeah, we work together in Ephesus. And and do you consider me a partner in the ministry? Well, if you do, then you need to welcome Onesimus as if it was me coming through the door. That's the statement he's making. If he has done you wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. So this if here is there, again, Paul knows that he's done something wrong. Onesimus probably told him what he did. And, and told him how he stole whatever it was in order to be able to, to live and survive. So if he has done anything in you any wrong, you charge that to me, Paul says. I, Paul, I'm writing this in my own hand, I will pay it back. But, he says, don't forget, you owe me your very soul. I led you to Christ too. 
Um, <clears throat> it's interesting because the statement that he makes here in 18 and 19, he's using legal language as if you were doing a, a, a loan from somebody and you were going to pay it back. And the way, you dis- the way it would be written up is the way he's writing it here. You know, uh, I will repay was the statement that the person who was taking uh, responsibility for the loan would write that on the bottom of whatever the document was. I will repay. And Paul's saying, whatever he's done, I will repay. What's he doing? Well, he's removing any hindrance to these two brothers in Christ having fellowship. If the whole time that this is going on, there's Philemon saying, well, I'm supposed to treat you like a brother, but man, you stole thousands of dollars from me when you left, and I'm, you know, I'm never going to get that back. And Paul's saying, hey, let's remove all that. Whatever it is, I will take care of it. Put it on my tab. It'll get taken care of. So there's nothing financial between the two of you. You're brothers in Christ. Now you need to act like it. I think that's exactly what he's saying to them in that language. And he says, refresh my heart. Um, I do wish, brother, that I would have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart. And I think he's saying, listen, your love is so powerful to everyone else around. I want you to continue refreshing my heart by how you take Onesimus in and how you treat him. Remember, he's sending Onesimus back. He's still in prison, so he can't come. He's expecting to be released. That's what he's expecting, but it hasn't happened at this point. Now, there's an implication here for us. Verse 15, it seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. That's a new living. And, and, and again, I love the way it's stated. You lost him for a while. Uh, and then in, uh, the ESV says, he was parted from you for a while. And the Phillips translation says, there has been a purpose in your losing him. Like he kind of, you know, just lost him when they went out for a walk and he didn't come back. All of that is to say, Paul, Paul understands. He, he knows what's happening here. But God is at work and he's using Paul uh, and others to bring Onesimus to the point of believing the gospel. And then once he, once he accepted Christ, the sovereignty of God was seen in all the way the things come together. Stop and think about this. Onesimus runs away from Philemon, and it's roughly a thousand miles all the way to Rome, I think. And uh, so he gets to Rome, and this is one of the largest cities in the world at that time. Estimates of 800 to 1,000 to a million in the city. And I'm sure what he was doing was saying, hey, I'm going to go somewhere where they can't find me. There'll be so many people that uh, I can just kind of get lost in, in that group. And so he runs away and he gets lost. And somehow he meets Paul. You know, that's the story I want to know. <laughs> How did that happen? And he gives us nothing. He just says, well, yeah, you know. I met him. He was in prison with me, <laughs> but not in prison in the sense of being a prisoner because Paul was in his own house, in his rented facility. So somehow, the two of them come together, and over time, Onesimus receives the Lord, and they, I think at some point in there, also discover that, oh, we both know this guy named Philemon back in Colossae. And so you've got all of this going on, and, and Paul is saying, hey, you know, <clears throat> this is an incredible thing. Now, Let's look at another example of the sovereignty of God at work, because that's what I think is happening in Onesimus' conversion. I mean, of all the people in the city of Rome, how in the world did he meet up with Paul? But he did, and he believed, and he was saved. Now, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples started to preach, and, and the crowds got larger and bigger, and people were believing. And then one day, Peter and John were going to the temple, and they saw a crippled man, and they raised him up so that he could walk. And they're, of course, arrested for this good work and thrown in jail overnight, and then they're treated very badly the next day. And, and they basically say to the disciples, you can't talk about Jesus anymore. You can't preach in his name. And Peter says, hey, salvation is found in no other name. How, what, are, what do you mean? We can't do that. Of course we're going to do that. Uh, no other name under heaven is given by which we may be saved. And so, you know, he, he, they have this confrontation, and the religious leaders threaten them again and told them to stop, and they threaten them big time, and they send them home. So they come to the disciples, all of them that have gathered together. They were praying for Peter and John, and, <clears throat> and they pray to the Lord, and they start out, Acts 4, 24, with this statement. O sovereign Lord. Yeah, we just got out of prison. You know, they threatened us. They told us not to preach in Jesus' name. Sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, 
the sea and everything in them. Dropping down to verse 29, they say, Consider their threats, the religious leaders, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. But they start out with sovereign God, you're in control, you know what's happening, you've heard all the things they've threatened us with, now you gave us a task to do, help us to do what you've called us to do. You give us the strength. You give us the ability to stand out there and preach boldly the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You help us to do that. And the reason they prayed that is they knew God was sovereign and God was in control. Paul saw each conversion, each person's conversion, as a sovereign act of God. And and that's why... Every now and then I have an opportunity to sit down with people I've not met and have them share a little bit of their, of their testimony, how they come to Christ and how they've grown. That kind of, and it's just, there's no two that are the same. Everybody's unique and different. And God reaches down and uses different passages of Scripture and different people in different situations, and he saves people. What an incredible thing. I had a friend of mine way back that uh, when he went to college, the, his first year away from home, uh, he got sucked into the Moonies, if you remember the Moonies. They're still around. Uh, Sun Young Moon was a, a cult leader. And so they had made it their goal, this group on the campus, to, to get him. They wanted him. And so they, and they just kept after him and kept after him and kept after him. But the minute he started to question or the minute he talked about doubts, then they, they got even harsher in their pursuit of him. Finally, at the end of that year, he said, I can't, I can't stand being here with these people doing this. So he transferred to another campus the other side of the state. For the next three years, the people from InterVarsity on that campus <laughs> spent time with him and became friends with him. And over a period of time, he became a Christian as a result of that and began to uh, learn and be discipled and grow. Now stop and think about that. God used the harsh practices of the Moonies, that cult, to force this friend of mine, to go where he wanted him to be. That's the sovereign God saying, I'm going to put all of this together, and this is where you need to be, and these are the people who you're going to find. That's the sovereignty of God at work in salvation. So we pray, and we ask God to do his work, and we ask him to let us be a part of it, if that's what he wants, and then we choose to keep on going and and honor him. Very quickly, the last section here... He says, confident of your obedience. And again, (laughs) this was a strong appeal, but now he's saying, I'm confident of your obedience. So you're actually going to do this. Uh, Knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And the implication there is that he's not just going to welcome him in as a brother. He's going to set him free. He will no longer be a slave. That's the implication there. And then he goes on to say, hey, one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because guess what? If you keep praying, I'm going to get out of here. So I don't know if they had a prayer meeting immediately, but I'll bet you they started praying a whole lot more for Paul because he said, in answer to your prayer, the Lord is going to have me <clears throat> released. Now, Paphras is mentioned here, and it's very possible that he is actually the guy that helped start those three churches in Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. He's actually in prison with Paul at this point. Um, and in Colossians, he mentions how he prays for them and works for them all the time. Um, tradition tells us that at the end of all of this, that somehow Onesimus ends up in Ephesus and he grows and becomes a church leader. And it's during his lifetime that the church in Ephesus started to compile the books of Paul and get them copied and recopied and tried to get those into the churches and into the homes of people. So imagine the massive amount of work that would be to take all of the different letters of Paul scattered all over the world at that point and get copies of them and start making some form of, some, of a way so that they could get those out. Now, what is our takeaway? Philemon is a letter, I mentioned it earlier, from a Jewish prisoner to a wealthy Gentile about a born-again slave. Uh, the book of Philemon is focused on, I believe, relationships. That's the biggest and most important thing that Paul's trying to do here. Paul had a relationship with Philemon. He had a relationship with Onesimus. Onesimus and Philemon had a relationship. And now he ran away, and all of this mess, you still have these three people who all know each other. And Paul's trying to say, listen, Philemon, I know you, and I love you, and I know you love me. I love Onesimus, my son. And now he's coming back to you because legally he's still your property. 
what are we going to do about this? There's that whole idea of relationship that's going on there. Uh, Paul led Onesimus to faith in Christ, and so Onesimus was reconciled to God. He was saved, born again, reconciled with God. And now what Paul is saying, okay, all of us are reconciled to God because we've been forgiven sinners. Now I want there to be reconciliation between Onesimus and Philemon. And that's what this letter is all about. Saying to Philemon, hey, he's, he's a brother in Christ. And this communication between the two of you needs to be taken care of as well. That's why in verse 7 he says, Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, refresh the hearts of the saints. Verse 5, I heard about your faith and your love for all the saints. Now, this is one of the saints, Philemon. Onesimus is one of the saints. And I know he's your property, but I want you to welcome him as a brother. So he sends a runaway slave back, but he intercedes for him. And what he's looking for is that there will be a unity So that the three of them, when they're in the same room together, will just be brothers in Christ. And there won't be any of this uh, oppressiveness of of a master and a slave. Um, Love and reconciliation are are really, I think, the key to this whole letter. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see the new has come. So Onesimus and Philemon both had become Christians. They are both new creations. They both believed in Jesus Christ and his death. Both of them were born again because of the love Christ poured out on them. And so the encouragement now is uh, the gospel, salvation through the death of Christ comes from reconciliation with God. You're both reconciled to God now, reconciled to each other. Verse 18, Paul says, everything from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Is there any any doubt now as to why Paul sent this letter and sent Onesimus back? He says, I have a ministry. My ministry is to help people be reconciled to God, and now you both are. Now let's, but all of us carry on that same ministry together. We're reconciled to God through the death of Christ, who paid for all of our sins. And as a result, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Paul then goes on to say in his letter to the Corinthians, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. And that was his message as he wrote the church in Corinth. And by the way, that's our message. We want people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and they need to be reconciled to Christ. And that's the prayer we can pray. Be reconciled. This is time. Can I share with you how? It's time to get that relationship with God straightened around. And then as that relationship with God is, is okay and straightened out, then we can have those relationships with each other as well. Well, that's kind of our start of a study of the book of Colossians. And next week, we can jump into chapter 1. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word, and thank you for the fact that you have given us clear teaching about what it is that you long to see in each of us. Lord, I pray that I would become an encourager for others and that I would take seriously the ministry of reconciliation. Help me, Lord God, in those things. I pray for us as a church family that we would take seriously the opportunities that we have to help people be reconciled first to you and then to become part of the church family. And so we thank you, we praise you, We worship you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and respond together with one more song this morning. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after Thee. To all our hearts desire and I long to worship Thee. To all our my strength, my shield, to You.
Receive the benediction. As we leave today, set free, O Lord, the souls of your servants from all restlessness and anxiety. Give us your peace and power, and so keep us that in all perplexity and distress we may abide in you, upheld by your strength, and stayed on the rock of your faithfulness through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Have a great week serving our King.